Andrei does mine. I don't know. We don't mind. So Andrei does mine. So yeah, we're all happy about that. So okay, we can hear you. So please uh, go ahead. Okay, uh, just one question: How much time do I actually have? Because we're starting a little later. Uh, you are supposed to to end the talk in forty minutes plus five of questions. Okay. So you have right. questions in the talk, but just. It's okay. Um, all right, then uh, I'll jump right in. Um, um, and I want to thank Andre for the for the invitation <clears throat> to give this talk. And um, basically, uh, I will talk about um, a couple of um, sort of um, ongoing stories. So first of all, of course, I'll, I'll give a little bit of an introduction of uh, twisted biographene and Maurice systems. Then, um, as the previous speaker uh, already uh, touched base upon, I will talk a, a, a uh, a lot about um, sort of the ongoing story on strange metallicity uh, in the system and uh, maybe a sort of analogy to quantum critical systems. Uh, last but not least, I'll likely talk about magnetic Joseon junctions. Um, uh, and before I really jump into the physics, I really also want to introduce a little bit um, uh, ourselves. So we were a group in uh, ICFO in Barcelona for the last couple of years, but um, as of the summer, we are uh, fully located at LMU Munich, and uh, we are part of uh, quantum uh, Munich Quantum Valley there, and so on. Uh, and uh, really, I want to also mention that because we were just starting this new operation there, we also have a lot of positions. So if you know anybody who would be interested, uh, please uh, spread the information. Uh, and also, um, I want to mention that uh, we're also very um, happy to have uh, really fantastic theory collaborators like Andrew Bernovic, Alan McDonald, Eric Davidov, and so on, uh, who helped us a lot uh, to interpret our data. So uh, really, um, of course, for this audience, this is no news, but let me just give it, uh, give sort of my sort of thoughts about the ongoing story in the twisted bilateral So as you all know, uh, um, this field is now something like four and a half years old. So Pablo discovered superconductivity and correlated insulators back in 2018. And of course, ever since that time, there were a lot of um, uh, um, sort of other reports and, uh, which uh, uh, reported many different phases. And of course, at the center of it is uh, superconductivity, correlated insulators, of course, non-trivial topology. Uh, and many groups have observed an almost quantum Hall effect, for example, and churn insulators, orbital magnetism, uh, and of course, this alleged uh, strange metal phase. And sort of my take on this is really that, I mean, we're first of all, of course, we're really excited to work uh, with a, such a rich system, but uh, sort of moving on um, uh, for the next couple of years, my take on it is that really a lot of these phases uh, while observed um, and uh, phenomenology seems to be kind of uh, pointing to a, a certain direction. Um, many of these phases are still not exactly understood. So um, we might have not uh, yet um, uh, uncovered, for example, the nature of superconductivity, whereas, of course, most people that you talk um, to these days would sort of favor a very unconventional um, um, mechanism, which, of course, is now also um, gaining some more evidence uh, from, the, from the experiments. Uh, also, some of the better understood phases, uh, I think, are the topological phases and the orbital magnetic phases, because these seem to be more or less um, uh, directly understood from uh, single particle arguments and sort of winding numbers and so on. Um, uh, and of course, uh, there is still this uh, story of uh, uh, strange metallicity, which, which was highly debated in the last couple of years. And uh, basically, in the first part of my talk, I'll try to give you some uh, sort of uh, additional experiments that we have conducted recently and sort of our, our sort of um, uh, current thoughts uh, about this phase as well. Um, and so before I jump um, into the, the details of the experiment, I just really want to uh, also give um, a little bit of um, sort of contrast, um, sort of uh, why we think this uh, system is very special. So first of all, of course, uh, these Moray systems show all this rich phenomenology but the, they show these on very different length scales and very different energy scales than what you typically uh, are used to in uh, crystals. So in crystals like the cuprates, of course, the interlayer spacing is just a few angstroms, which is sort of almost two orders of magnitude smaller than in the uh, twisted bilateral where it's more like 10 nanometers. Uh, and therefore, of course, the interaction energies uh, on the lattice are also very different. So uh, instead of EV, uh, in crystals, we get a much smaller interaction energies in the orders of MAV. Uh, and of course, all of that is also uh, can be contrasted to optical lattices, where of course, very um, 
beautiful uh, experiments uh, have been done over the last years. Uh, and here again, uh, twisted bilayer thing shows different length scales. So instead of uh, micrometers uh, and extremely low uh, interaction energies like pico electron volts, um, moray materials have here is sort of the intermediate uh, spot between those systems. But um, while this is basically clear, I also want to uh, mention some technological sort of aspects that uh, make the system different and uh, allow us to uh, use entirely no novel tuning knobs to control the system. And for this, I really want to, um, sorry, I'll close the window here. Uh, for this, I really want to um, go back to sort of a simple um, a brainstorming based on the, the Hubbard model. And again, here um, in a Hubbard model, the most important sort of energy scales are the kinetic energy T, which sort of describes hopping between uh, the lattice sites and the on-site uh, energy U, which uh, sort of is a Coulomb energy if uh, two particles are uh, occupied in the same lattice site. And I want to really stress that uh, in the system here, we in principle have control over both of these parameters and the control is uh, rather, uh, rather good. So for example, T of course, the kinetic energy uh, can be controlled by twist angle. So uh, this graph here shows the density of state's evolution as a function of uh, twist angle. Of course, we at a 1.1 degrees twist angle, we have the by far the largest density of states. And this is because we have the smallest uh, bandwidth and therefore the kinetic energy is also the smallest in this point, but we can always control the twist angle and move slightly away from this point and change this parameter. Uh, so therefore T is really, uh, kinetic energy is really just a function of uh, twist angle and we can sort of adjust to that. And of course also U is also a function of the complex dielectric environment in which we uh, sub subject the twisted bilateral samples uh, usually they're encapsulated in uh, HPN. This is an insulator with a dielectric constant of 3.9, but in principle, you can choose other materials with different uh, dielectric constants. And also what we also can do is uh, place metallic gates very closely to the twisted bilayer graphene, even uh, nanometers. Um, and a number of papers um, have reported that really these uh, metallic screening uh, gates can uh, effectively also alter U. So in principle, U is also uh, control of and therefore we have really in contrast to the crystals and optical lattices we have really control over the u over t ratio here uh, and really um, let me jump in into sort of the transport data so I really just want to show the richness of the technology in a couple of graphs so this is a as a device that we measured um, uh, uh, which basically shows the uh, uh, longitudinal resistance and the hole resistance as a function of carry density and temperature here. Uh, and really what we uh, like to do in the system, typically we try to translate the carry density that which we actually uh, control with, with the gate. So we can continue continuously control the carry density in the system. And we like to translate this carry density into a filling factor, which is basically counting the electrons per moradium itself. So we can really plot um, the resistance here is a function of filling factor of one electron per unit cell, two and three electrons per unit cell. And you already see that at many of the exact integer fillings, uh, the resistance uh, might have some uh, enhanced values. And uh, really this is uh, these sort of uh, red regions here of high resistance are this, these uh, alleged uh, correlated insulators um, that are basically um, interaction driven uh, mod insulators if you want. Uh, Flanking these correlated insulators, very often we observe superconducting domes where really resistance drops to zero with a TC of around uh, three, um, three to five Kelvin or one to five Kelvin, depending on the device. Uh, and really we can tune between these phases uh, continuously with the gate. So we can, by applying just a slightly different gate voltage, we can tune out of the correlated insulator into the superconductor and, and so on. Uh, then uh, this is really um, not, uh, given in every device, but in this particular device, we also observed at filling factor one here, we observed uh, orbital magnetic state. So basically we measure here RxY as a function of uh, magnetic field direction and around uh, zero magnetic field, we observe these uh, hysteresis loops um, where the RxY value um, almost um, uh, sort of reaches a value of uh, uh, H over E squared. So it's almost quantized here. Uh, and really in other sort of uh, devices um, uh, by uh, Andrea Young and uh, Corey Lee, uh, and um, David Goldhammer-Gordon, they also saw really quantization 
of uh, such states. And, and really, we interpret these uh, states right now as orbital magnets, where basically the magnetization comes mostly from, from sort of orbital motion of the electrons uh, in the bulk of the, of the device. Uh, then uh, what we can uh, do to stabilize these orbital magnetic states, or, or in other words, zero field charge oscillators, we can actually apply some uh, magnetic field in the perpendicular direction, and we can actually stabilize these um, churn, um, churn insulators, uh, and we can reveal many, many more of them and also other integer fillings. And it, this is sort of data, which you can see here. We're really starting from each uh, integer filling, we observe uh, sort of churn insulators uh, with different churn numbers, with a very well-defined sequence of churn numbers, actually. Uh, and last but not least, uh, if we sort of tune in the center of the band, um, uh, where basically the, the, there are no phase transitions and we just uh, have this metallic state. Uh, analyzing closely this metallic state really reveals um, some, um, some really strange metal uh, behavior, uh, which is really in contrast to what we observe in um, normal metals or in single layer graphene for, for, that, for that matter. And really I wanna start now with uh, the strange metal phase and wanna uh, give you an overview of um, sort of uh, what we, uh, found out uh, in some, some recent work of ours. Uh, and really jumping in into that uh, strange metal phase, I really uh, want to sort of have a, uh, to paint sort of a very naive hand wavy uh, comparison to um, other systems that uh, people reported similar behavior in. So of course those are cuprates, hemifermian systems, pnictides, and uh, what these systems uh, may have a phenomenologically at least um, in common, is that really close to some magnetic phase transitions uh, and, and sort of embedded into a, a superconducting dome. Uh, they often have a, sort of, they observe a metallic state that uh, cannot be described by Fermi liquid theory, uh, which uh, is uh, typically giving rise to a linear uh, resistance as a function of temperature. Again, in contrast to Fermi liquid, which would predict uh, a power law dependence. Uh, some of these systems also showed uh, striking linear magneto resistance uh, at around the same sort of density ranges uh, as the linear temperature dependence appears. And uh, closer analysis of the scattering rates in these systems uh, often show blanking scattering rates, which means that basically uh, even uh, at low and height, even in a, sort of at any temperature limit of, um, uh, of these systems, uh, they observe a blanking scattering rate, which means that the uh, electrons scatter as fast as allowed uh, by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And in particular, I think at low temperatures where phonons, uh, et cetera, are not so strong, uh, it's of course the question what can give rise to such uh, strong uh, scattering, um, fast scattering events. Okay, so, and uh, really um, going, moving over to the developing story in twisted bilayer, of course, uh, this topic is not uh, new. So Pablo has reported on some strange metal behavior back in 2019, I think. This was one of the first papers on this um, on twisted bilayer graphene in general. Uh, and this is the data here on the left, which Pablo uh, painted back then. So this is um, showing resistivity as a function of temperature. And really for a broader dense uh, region in the center of the band, where interactions are uh, supposedly the strongest, you observed a striking behavior that starting from around one Kelvin to 30 Kelvin, uh, the linear, uh, the temperature dependence was extremely linear of the resistance. Uh, and moreover, the slope of this resistance was extremely high. So it really was a slope of uh, maybe 100% per Kelvin. Uh, and um, this um, uh, basically uh, was tied to sort of the observation of the scattering planking rate, uh, uh, planking scattering rate, uh, which go went along with that. So, um, However, very soon after, there was basically a um, sort of um, uh, follow-up story by Andrea Young and Corrigin, who basically reported that many of these linear temperature dependencies that uh, Pablo was observing could be potentially also explained by electron phonon interaction. So there was really a big uh, debate uh, about this. And so um, I uh, uh, basically worked on the electron phonon scattering in single layer graphene with Philip Kim back, uh, back in 2010. Uh, and we really um, uh, sort of felt in the good position to sort of uh, start analyzing um, uh, this uh, twisted bilayer graphene system, starting from sort of what we have learned in the past from single layer graphene. 
And again, single layer vacuum is a system which doesn't show strong interactions. Everything is defined by single particle uh, picture. Everything uh, is uh, behaves like a Fermi liquid. So in principle, we wanted to really first go down onto the uh, uh, sort of uh, lessons learned from single layer vacuum and then try to see whether we can directly apply it uh, to a twisted biography and uh, also uh, and define the limit in which it could hold and the limits in which maybe it should fail. And so um, looking at this data from uh, 2010, again, what, what is striking if you look at the resistivity as a function of temperature is really that indeed at low temperatures, the system behaves some sort of, shows some sort of parallel behavior and only at higher temperatures at around hundred Kelvin or so, it becomes linear. So really the linear temperature dependence is a high uh, temperature regime. And this is better seen here at the log log plot. So we subtract the residual and uh, plot it on a log log scale. And you can see really in the low temperature limit, it's something like a two to the four behavior up to around 50 to hundred Kelvin, where then it becomes linear in high temperatures. And really uh, this regime um, is well, very well uh, explained uh, by sort of an effective block Grunheisen uh, uh, theory, where basically uh, instead of uh, the Dubai temperature, which sets uh, the energy scales for electron phonons capturing in normal metals, uh, where really uh, the Fermi surface is extremely big and the Fermi surface is the size of the um, 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 uh, brilliant zone. In the graphene, we have, of course, a semi-metallic uh, case where the Fermi surface is much, much smaller than the uh, brilliant zone. And therefore, uh, to have quasi-elastic scattering of the electrons and phonons uh, on the Fermi surface, uh, we need to uh, sort of define a, a effective uh, Dubai temperature which is basically proportional to the size of the Fermi surface. And this is uh, basically the, this block room as a temperature, which has a, a value, which is uh, orders of magnitude smaller than the, than the real Dubai temperature. Uh, and because this Dubai temperature, uh, the block room temperature is proportional to the Fermi surface, it's also proportional directly to square root N. So it's proportional to the carrier density and can be tuned. And this is also the scene also in our single layer graphene data. And so the, the resulting Boltzmann transport picture that describes this, uh, this behavior is really giving rise to a linear, uh, sorry, of T to the four low temperature behavior, which then becomes linear uh, in a high, high temperatures. And so what, uh, if I just apply this uh, very simple um, uh, theory to a uh, twisted bilayer, I, uh, one can immediately sort of uh, find a few parameters that maybe uh, can be normalized here. So first of all, in twisted bilayer, of course, as we know, the carrier density can be extremely small. It's uh, it's in the orders of 10 to the 11 a centimeter per square. So in principle, the, the effect of the by temperature can really be much smaller here, pushing sort of this low temperature limit to uh, low, lower temperatures. Uh, but still, it, for us, it was really hard to define a, find a scenario where the block realizing temperature would be way below 10 Kelvin. Um, uh, under any sort of circumstances, we would ex expect the block realizing temperature to be much bigger than one Kelvin. So in principle, that sets, sets us a little bit the limit in which we would expect this linear temperature dependence. So it would be way above one Kelvin uh, and not, definitely not below. Uh, and of course, the other thing which, which you can see from this formula is that the Fermi velocity is in the square here in the denominator. And that effectively means that the slope uh, in twisted bilayer of this linear temperature dependence can be also extremely high, just because really the Fermi velocity becomes so small uh, in the flat bound. So, okay, so uh, for this really to address this problem, we really uh, then uh, identified uh, immediately, so the, the region in which we wanted to look at that problem, we really wanted to go to millikelvin temperatures to like uh, basically 40 millikelvin, as low as we can get with our bridges, and to see whether this linear temperature dependence survives here, because that would exactly mean that um, at such low temperatures, a phonon picture cannot explain uh, the scattering uh, processes. Uh, and really, um, uh, we identified this regime to look at. So what uh, was in the past a little bit challenging, um, uh, uh, really in these devices, is that the low temperature regime was typically obscured by a lot of phase transitions. So of course, you have correlated insulators, which set in at one point. So these correlated insulators, of course, obscure this metallic behavior. So we used one of those devices that we made that, that those are, um, have a 
um, uh, twist angles uh, that, that goes away from the um, magic angle and which shows uh, therefore a weaker uh, correlated insulators. And also of course, this was uh, one of those screen devices that we used. Um, and, and basically what you can see is sort of this um, device had a really broad metallic region and the metallic region was not obscured by any correlated insulator. So we can really study this metallic behavior starting all the way from 30 Kelvin down to 40 millikelvin uh, over three orders of magnitude. Uh, and we can really try to take a look uh, what's going on in this metallic region. Uh, and one word I want to mention up front. So even though the correlated insulator was not strong in this device, this device showed a very strong superconducting uh, uh, dome uh, with a TC of around two Kelvin. So in principle, as I will later on also show, uh, this gave us also the opportunity to study sort of what's going on um, with the superconductor uh, in this sort of um, strange metal phase. And so um, basically this is uh, the data that we obtained. So um, similar to what we plotted for single layer graphene, so we plot resistivity as a function of temperature. And you already can see that in the center of the band, so basically for filling factors of minus two, minus 2.8, minus 1.6, in the center of the band, really, uh, the, uh, uh, there are many curves that uh, are very linear. Um, uh, and uh, when we go away from the center of the bands, we observe something more like parallel behavior. Like here, for example, close to charge neutrality point, it looks much more like parallel behavior now and also close to the band insulator here. And again, much better visible uh, is the subtracted and log log scale uh, plot here. So really, if we take some of these uh, uh, curves at the center of the, of the band, they're linear over three orders of magnitude, all the way from 40 millikelvin to 30 Kelvin. And again, close to the band edges, it's again a t, rather a T squared dependence. So here T1 power 1.9 or T power 2.1. So close to the band edges and charge neutrality point, this sort of linear temperature dependence really disappears. And so if we now try to sort of plot where we would expect sort of the, the, the lowest limit of block and temperature that we can uh, really uh, argue here, uh, then it's really uh, sitting somewhere in the center of these linear curves. So really everything which is below that temperature and specifically the 40 millikelvin regime and, and so on, we really cannot um, uh, explain by the uh, uh, electron photon interaction. And therefore we conclude that this is really a good sort of a hint that really the strange metal phase uh, is sort of the preferred way of thinking about this. Of course, uh, as I mentioned before, Dimitri, we... Dimitri, sorry, there is a question in the chat. Yeah. Maybe you, you would sure. like to answer immediately from Pierce. So what is the possible origin of the larger residual resistivity? Can it derive from angular disorder? Here in the device, you showed that... What is the origin? Okay, so basically, why is the resistivity here kilo ohms, right? That's the question, the residual resistivity. So why there is a, what is the origin of such a large residual resistivity? Right. So I mean, uh, this is this is uh, the um, this is the big question, I guess. So I think um, uh, one can argue that this is really some um, interactions, uh, maybe some again some some uh, magnetic fluctuations and so on, which gives you rise to 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 these strong scattering events. Of course, me uh, some other uh, people would argue that uh, maybe some uh, abundant soft mode. Uh, um, soft modes, maybe uh, even phonon soft modes uh, are residing at uh, these low temperatures. So this is uh, in large part uh, uh, open question. Um, I, I think disorder uh, and twist angle disorder, I mean, to my taste, uh, this is maybe uh, explaining it uh, much less because uh, my argument for this would be we, we measure also devices with 1.2 degrees, 1.3 degrees, which in principle have the same twist angle disorder as these magic uh, angle graphene devices, but they show much lower residual resi resistances. Uh, they behave, they, they look much more like uh, single, they start to look much more like single layer graphene. Uh, and for me, this is striking that this residual resistance is, is such a steep function of the twist angle. Uh, and really it's becomes only so big when also interactions become big. Uh, but of course, I don't know, maybe there's some scenario where Interactions are enhanced by disorder, probably, um, yeah. But overall, I would say it's an open question at this point. Uh, can you hear me, Dimitri? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah just yeah. Uh, uh, the residual resistance seems to be much larger in this 
sample where you've tuned away from the magic angle than it is at the magic angle, or did I get that wrong? You've got a, a large offset. Your, your resistivity curves look a lot like cerium copper six gold, where there is a linear resistance, but it's uh, small compared to the, or comparable compared with the, with the residual resistivity here. You ah, okay. Have, uh, ah. Is this the same? Is this oh. the same? See as seen in the magic angle samples. I see. So I see. Okay. Um, maybe this is not good to look at this data right now because we offset the curves to to make. Oh, a curve. Yeah. See. Maybe it's better to look at Pablo's data here. Um, yeah. So if you see. see. So if you if you take Pablo's data, you could sort yeah, of go to the surface. I see. I I yeah. Got the, 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 so the slope is actually um, the slope is easily um, fifty percent of per Kelvin or something like that. I see. So the yeah. the the lin the rise over the 30, 30 Kelvin region is much larger than the residual resistivity in your DC exactly. Example. Okay. It's almost like an order of magnitude larger. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That was very confusing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um. Any more questions about, um, okay, otherwise um, I'll move on. And so, okay, so I think, um, so, okay, so I think based on this data, which I showed you, I think um, it's a rather a test sort of, uh, sort of a more close look at what happens at low temperatures. And I think we, we like to confirm our findings with uh, or the early findings of Pablo. Uh, but of course, we also like to make a little bit more tests to, uh, to sort of this behavior. And one test, which I um, mentioned at the very beginning is also magneto resistance. And strikingly also the magneto resistance uh, that we observe here shows a very similar trend to what uh, the linear temperature dependence showed. So again, in the center of the band at filling factor minus two, or again, close to it, we see a striking linear magneto resistance uh, which then uh, becomes much more parallel behavior dependent uh, when we move closer to the bent edges, to the insulators, uh, to the single particle insulators and to the charge neutrality form. Uh, and the striking thing is really the density dependence over which we observe the magneto resistance and the uh, linear temperature dependence are exactly the same. So really this, this um, linear in T and linear in B dependence uh, arises at exactly the same carrier densities. Um, and really, not, not just that, but also the temperature dependence over which we observe this um, linear magneto resistance is also almost the same to the range in temperature over which we observe the linear temperature dependence. So for example, here really at 40 millikelvin, we observe a really steep linear magneto resistance. However, at around 50 Kelvin, it's almost gone similar to sort of the temperature at which the, the linear temperature dependence also stops uh, to exist. So, so also the temperature dependence over which we observe these uh, effects is, seems to be also uh, coinciding. Um, of course, we also did uh, analysis of the scattering rates. So again, we uh, just measured the, um, uh, the uh, effective mass uh, from shumik of the house oscillations, and we were able to, to really uh, sort of uh, extract the scattering rates for, for all of these curves uh, and uh, really compare them to what's expected from banking scattering rate, H uh, bar over KVT. And really for the whole range of this linear temperature dependence, uh, again, over three orders of magnitude, starting from 40 millikelvin, we observe that all of these curves uh, that show linear magnetos, uh, linear temperature dependence, they also show um, um, planking limit. Uh, and really, this is uh, particularly surprising that even at 40 millikelvin, uh, this uh, planking limit holds, which again, uh, to me, uh, kind of, maybe this is the previous question, to me, this is a kind of um, maybe some, um, some argument that uh, maybe there is some scattering event, uh, intrinsic scattering event in, in the system, maybe tied again with the strong uh, correlations uh, in the system that, uh, is present even at the lowest temperatures, which would maybe give rise to such a, uh, a fast scattering rate. But this is, of course, uh, this is just uh, uh, brainstorming. So of course, um, um, of course, uh, many other things could could maybe explain this as well. Um, 
So one thing I want to, sh to also uh, really um, um, show you to convince you that um, uh, is that really we also studied all the different twist angles. So we studied a number of devices close to the magic angle, where again, strong correlations, um, in particular, um, superconductivity, signatures of correlated insulators and so on was observed. But these devices uh, all showed uh, this linear temperature dependence. Uh, and then of course, we had a number of devices where, where the twist angle was already much bigger. So for example, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5 degrees. And in these devices, which were away from the magic angle where we don't see strong correlations, uh, all of this sort of strange metal behavior was gone. And this is, for example, shown here in this device for 1.4 degrees. All of these devices, if I look at them, um, they don't show really uh, uh, pronounced linear temperature dependence at low temperatures. And in general, this device to me looks much more similar to single layer graphene than to, uh, than to whatever we see uh, in magic and graphene. And also looking at the residual resistance here, again, these curves are offset, but this blue curve is, is probably the right one. So as you see, so the residual resistance in a 1.4 degree device is already an order of magnitude lower than the residual resistance in magic angle graphene. So somehow um, really this residual resistance is a strong function of the, of the, of the twist angle, or in other words, uh, maybe of the uh, interactions that are, that are present in the system. Okay, so uh, one thing I um, also want to show is of course the superconductive dome here, which I um, showed you here. So uh, we of course, uh, wanted to know what is sort of the underlying metallic state for the superconducting dome. So superconductivity can be killed in this graphene by applying a very small magnetic field of around 300 millitesla. So again, I think in the group rates, right, you need to apply something like 60 tesla to, to, kill, to kill the superconductivity and see what's underneath. Here we, it's, we really survive with 30, 300 millitesla. Uh, and really, if we then um, sort of look at this uh, metallic state at 300 millitesla. Uh, we also recovered this um, linear temperature dependence and linear magneto resistance. Uh, and uh, really this kind of maybe um, is a way of saying that uh, it looks like that the underlying uh, parent state of the superconductivity is really this uh, strange metal um, uh, that, that sort of um, is the under, uh, underlying parent state of the superconductivity. Uh, and with this, I really want to sort of show uh, you the phase diagram here. So really, uh, uh, the obtained phase diagram as a function of temperature and carrier density uh, is some, something like the following. So indeed, at the band gap edges, so here, close to the band insulator and close to the charge neutrality, this is basically where typically we don't expect strong uh, interactions. Uh, this is uh, typically a very dilute sort of um, the system here, um, we really observed this thermal liquid light behavior, which again manifested itself in a E squared and B squared uh, resistivity. Then in the center of the band, really we observe a broader region of uh, strange metal, which is um, which sort of has linear temperature dependence, magnetic resistance and planking scattering rates. And then uh, the superconducting dome that we see here, is really somehow embedded in, a, in this broader uh, strange metal region. So if we kill the superconductor by a small magnetic field, we, we obtain, uh, again, this strange metal phase. Um, and with this, I really, uh, without sort of uh, any sort of uh, claim to, to understand uh, the physics here, uh, really uh, just a hand wavy sort of analogy. So of course, um, we talked to Pierce uh, Coleman about this. And of course, we read also the papers. And of course, a lot of uh, this uh, strange metal behavior uh, seems, um, uh, seems um, to, to, my, uh, to, to, to maybe has its origin uh, um, um, uh, in its existence due to this quantum critical point between a normal metal and some sort of magnetic ordering that, that occurs uh, in many of these systems. And of course, magnetic ordering this is very abundant in twisted bilayer graphene. So this is, for example, a recent work of ours with Ali Zeldov, which we were able to image this rich uh, magnetic domain wall structure in twisted bilayer graphene. Most of the time, it's not 
single ferromagnetism, but it's some sort of SU4, so spin and value uh, ferromagnetism, uh, where, of course, these magnetic states have often a, a strong orbital component to it, but also, uh, un, un, so basic non-trivial spin texture as well. Uh, and of course, I think this is just uh, sort of one uh, way to uh, start thinking about the system that maybe really magnetic fluctuations uh, play really a, a big role here uh, in the low temperature limit. But this is, of course, uh, not settling the issue at all. Of course, uh, many other people are proposing some other soft modes, even uh, electron phonon uh, interactions uh, that potentially could give rise to it. But I think it's it's an open question at this point. But it's I think at least to at least uh, from our side, we are getting more much more convinced that the analogy to other strange metals here is uh, much bigger than uh, than maybe uh, for, for, uh, for in the beginning. Uh, and with this, I think I'm I'm almost out of time. So I think maybe. I skipped the magnetic Joseph junctions and we uh, have more time for questions then. Thank you. Thank you. So there are a couple of questions. Yes, in the chat already here. So let's start from the audience. Uh, is it possible that the uh, larger residual resistivity at small twist angles is due to this uh, twist angle disorder that's more prevalent at small twist angles? Yeah, that's right. So basically, <laughs> this is um, the very same question I we had uh, earlier in the talk. Uh, so um, for this, um, uh, really, um, yeah. So maybe, maybe let me let me show you this graph here. So from what I understand about twist angle disorder, twist angle disorder between 1.1 degrees and 1.2 and 1.3 degrees should not be really dramatically different. So, um, so basically let's assume that twist angle disorder from 1.1 and 1.3 is almost the same. What you can see from these graphs here that I'm plotting is that the residual resistance is, is extremely, uh, enhanced close to the magic angle. So close to the magic angle, the residual resistance is around one kilo ohm, whereas for 1.3 and 1.4, 1.5 degrees, it's closer to 100 ohms, so maybe like even, even below that. So there is a dramatic enhancement of the residual resistivity close to the magic angle. And I don't think it can be just directly uh, explained by twist angle disorder. Um, I don't exclude, however, that maybe um, something couples to the disorder strong, more strongly at, uh, at uh, magic angle. So maybe there is some effect that um, where interaction, enhanced interactions, uh, flat bands, and uh, disorder maybe combined play a role. That, that I can't exclude. But not, but not twist angle disorder by itself. That I don't think so. Thank you, Dimitri. Another question here. Uh, if you apply a magnetic field in the strange metal phase, do you still get a linearity resistivity? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, right, yeah, so we do. I mean, uh, maybe you can, maybe this is seen here. I mean, we've, we've, we've checked that, so you do, I, uh, but um, basically this, this shows you sort of the data at, 300 millitesla, right? Um, you see that the linear magnetic resistance is still there. Uh, sorry, linear temperature dependence is still there. And 300 millitesla is already where we observe this uh, uh, this effect here. But if, if if you kill the magnetic fluctuation by applying the magnetic field, why should the strange metallic phase still persist? I mean, well, yeah, so maybe the, maybe there's, I mean, um, I think exactly. So I think um, I, I'll, I'll probably try to avoid to, to um, make a certain mechanism responsible for this. So whenever you, you make a mechanism responsible for this then you find loopholes how to avoid it, right? So yeah, that's, a, but that's, a, that's probably a question you can ask for any other strange metal system for the cooperates, you can ask the same question, right? Thanks. 
Yes, another question. Yeah, two questions actually. Firstly, um, this may not be known, but what happens to the resistivity at much higher temperatures? Does it saturate or does it continue oh. to up linearly? The second question uh, was, have you actually thought about what might happen to the phonon spectrum in twisted uh, oh, bilayers, right. which are exactly. falling? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So exactly. So basically, uh, above 30 Kelvin, uh, typically the re resistance becomes non-monotonic. So it becomes, actually, as you can see here, it starts to drop before it starts going up again. And then at high temperatures, it behaves really more like um, electron phonon. So I think people try to fit the high temperature limit. I mean, the 100, above 100 Kelvin, people try to fit the limit to, um, for example, umklap uh, phonon scattering. And that works OK, OK, I would say. Uh, uh, this downturn here is, uh, we also understand that downturn, that's non-monoticity. This is actually when the temperature uh, broadening becomes comparable to the band gaps in the system. So again, the flat bands are separated by small band gaps to higher order dispersive bands. And this is around the same, uh, this is around, this happens around 50 Kelvin or so. And this is basically where higher order bands become populated. And of course your resistance then has a uh, multiband transport properties and the resistance goes down. So this, this we understand, but we of course don't know if if uh, the strange metal phase would, I mean, if we would not populate the higher order bands, if the strange metal phase would continue, we, we don't know that at first. Um, and the second question was about uh, um, Moray phonons, right? So basically, it's okay, this is, phonon, a, yeah. yeah, so of course, of course, this is a question which um, uh, we get a lot. So basically, of course, the block runeisen uh, analogy that we used here um, is a direct analogy, sort of it's the same model uh, as in single layer graphene. And of course, um, we don't assume any Moray phonons here. I think um, what I can say about this is that somehow there, there has not been uh, too much. I mean, maybe, maybe I'm... Uh, Maybe I'm not correct about this, but um, I'll, I'll be happy to, to, to learn about it. Um, there has not been so much work that I'm aware of uh, on Moray phonons yet. And in, in general, um, experimental studies on phonons on the system are not that abundant at this point. So I think uh, we don't exclude this possibility at all. I think uh, we would be happy to, to, to learn more about it. I think um, one thing in the context of uh, phonons still is the surprising thing is the linear ma uh, magneto resistance. So I think a linear temperature dependence one can explain with a lot of soft mode um, uh, phonons uh, models and so on. I think the linear magneto resistance is a little harder to explain with uh, with a phonon picture. So I think um, right this is sort of our way of thinking at this point about it. Um, sorry, we are really running out of time. So maybe if there is, uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat. If somebody wants to ask, uh, maybe. Can I just, just put in? Which on the microphone had asked it? Pierce had a hand, yeah. Yeah, I have a hand up. Um, uh, Dimitri, yeah. wonderful talk, but um, for three years I've seen this similar behavior and I've always asked you the same question. What does the Hall constant do? Yes, yeah, so we're, we're doing yeah. that experiment now, yeah. You don't know yet. Okay, thank you. We don't know yet, yeah. Oh, okay, so anybody else wants to ask a question from the chat? Maybe switch on the microphone? Otherwise, okay. So uh, we thank again, Dimitri, for the very nice talk. Thank you. And the time. So since we are a bit delayed, so please come back in 20 minutes. And speakers of the next section, please log in in Zoom before, so that way you come here, everything is set down. Thank you.